All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining. Uh, today, we are very fortunate to have with us uh, Brian Wilder from Harvard University. Uh, Brian, uh, thank you so much for being here uh, and, and for sharing your research with us. Uh, he's a fine, finally a PhD student in computer science at Harvard University. Brian's research focuses on the intersection of optimization, machine learning, and social networks with the goal of improving population health. His work has been received or been nominated for best paper awards at ICML and AMOS. And he was also a finalist for the Informs Doing Good with Codoar competition. He is supported by the highly prestigious Siebel Scholars Program and previously received an NSF Graduate Research Fellowship. Brian is one of the smartest people that I know. Uh, and thank you so much, Brian, for being here. And you know, uh, happy to uh, look, you know, look forward to, your, uh, to, to listening about what you have us here. Whenever you're ready. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, well, thank you very much for, for having me here, Amelia, and for the, the very generous introduction. Um, and, and thanks all of you for, for being here. Um, so like Amelia said, this, this talk is about AI for population health. And so I want to start the talk off by, uh, by introducing the kind of the distribution of how we think about and invest in health at, at an aggregate level in the US. Um, so right now, the US spends about $10,000 per year on, on health. And we spend about 250 of those dollars um, on, on public health. That's, that's per person per year. And, uh, and so the, where does the rest of that $10,000 go? It goes mostly to, to clinical um, advances, right? You know, treatment for patients, developing new drugs. Um, and this is largely mirrored in the way that we typically do AI for health. Um, so here's looking at the recent Machine Money for Health conference in 2020, um, you know, going through the, the set of papers. Um, there's almost all of them are focused on clinical applications, on improving treatment for patients. And this is wonderful, right? This work is going to have a real impact for patients, but there's a lot of health that really doesn't get captured by this focus on what happens in the clinic in the hospital. Um, because a lot of the time our health depends on factors that are totally outside of that context of clinical treatment. And this is really brought into, you know, sort of you know, sharp relief by COVID-19, but it happens in a variety of ways, right? There's a set of individual level behaviors around preventative health, around adherence to medication. There's community level influences, the influences of people around us in, um, in society, on um, the services that were provided in our local communities. There's society level factors around policy decisions, how will we control infectious diseases, um, you know, provide resources for, for treatment of non-communicable diseases. And all of these things are form the kind of broader tapestry of individual and social behaviors that influence our well-being. And so what I want to ask in this talk is how can we develop artificial intelligence that benefits health at a population level? And so then when we think about uh, what sorts of AI that we need to, um, to address population, level, uh, population health challenges, there's at least a couple of distinctive features. Um, the first is that we always have limited resources. We're not thinking about just one patient. We're thinking about how to allocate the resources that we have as a community or as a society to create the biggest impact overall. And so that means that we need to decide where to focus resources, how to best target informational campaigns, which patients are in the most need of follow up. And then when we make those decisions, they're inevitably made under substantial uncertainty. Um, so we don't know a lot of things about the world. We don't know how a disease will propagate, how information will spread through a population. We don't know maybe which patients are at highest risk. And we need to account for those uncertainties when we decide how to allocate our limited resources. So my research focuses then um, on a more technical level on how we design systems that span this entire pipeline from data to deployment, how we navigate this process of domain modeling and immersion, um, designing how we gather data when doing so might be expensive or, or can only be done in limited quantities, how we use machine learning to extract predictive insights from that data, which then drive optimization and decision making, and how we deploy the resulting systems actually you know, in the field where they can have an impact. And so, um, and so my work covers you know, various kinds of, of sub-focuses um, in, the, in these different technical areas, thinking about how we get data and then use it to, to make decisions. And, uh, and also spans a set of application areas in parallel to that, um, oftentimes dealing with, with preventative health, public health, infectious diseases, and I've been fortunate to work with a number of amazing collaborators in these domains, um, you know, epidemiologists, public health officials, governments, nonprofits, uh, to be able to, to go to their community, to, to learn from them, and try to figure out where we can use AI to have the greatest impact overall. 
this talk is going to cover uh, kind of three example projects over the course of, of this work that illustrate different application domains and different ways of, of using AI throughout this pipeline. I'm going to start out with um, an, a project focused at, uh, at more of the individual level, thinking about how we improve medication adherence and tuberculosis treatment by integrating machine learning and discrete optimization. Then I'm going to take a step up to the community level, where we think about how to use uh, social influences to promote HIV, preventative behaviors against HIV among homeless youth. Um, this work draws on robust optimization and, uh, and thinks about how we gather information appropriately on social networks. And then finally, just briefly at the end of the talk, I'm going to cover um, some recent work, again, taking another step back at the, at the level of the society, thinking about how we develop better policy around COVID-19 by integrating agent-based models and agent inference to inform testing policy. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll dive into the first part of the work here. Um, and so please um, let me know if you have questions as we go. Um, you, can, you, know, you can type in the chat. Um, and, and normally, if I don't see it, you can, you can let me know, um, or, or you can unmute yourself and ask. Um, so getting started then with the first topic. Um, so I want to start by introducing the, the kind of uh, technical style of problem that we're going to be thinking about in this work, which is predictable to optimized problems. And so these are situations where we have an optimization problem, which is described by, by an objective function, f. And f is a function of two quantities. The first is x, our decision variable. So this describes how we're going to allocate our limited resources in whatever sense we're modeling in this domain. Um, so for example, how do we, um, x could describe which patients you're going to uh, do some sort of more intensive follow-up with and which you're not. And I'm going to be focused on discrete optimization problems, because often the, in these domains, we have to make a discrete decision. We either follow up with someone or these are, there's no sort of in-between necessarily. And then, uh, so F depends on our decision, but it also depends on theta, which is an unknown parameter describing the state of the world. Uh, so maybe this is some description of which patients will actually benefit the most from the intervention. And a lot of the time that when we go to solve the optimization problem, right, we try to find the best decision um, that will result in, in our highest utility. The challenge is that we don't know that state of the world. Uh, so this is why we do machine learning. We want to, we have other data that we want to try to use to infer the true value of an example that's going to motivate a lot of this work, like I uh, mentioned earlier, is tuberculosis treatment. And this work is focused on tuberculosis in India, which is a huge public health uh, sort of catastrophe ongoing. It causes millions of cases, hundreds of thousands of deaths each year. And one of the gaps in, in the, the sort of ecosystem of care is uh, medication adherence, because first-line tuberculosis treatment requires six months of daily antibiotics, and low adherence then leads to uh, reinfection if a patient isn't cured completely, it leads to drug, drug resistant strains. And so the front lines of this kind of battle against TB are the community health workers who try to counsel patients support and, and support their adherence as best as they can. Now, uh, there's a lot of uh, sort of uh, thought around how to improve adherence. And one sort of exciting new possibility is digital adherence technologies, which try to enable more effective and scalable follow-up. So this is an example of a system called 99Dots that's uh, deployed in some states in India and has been chosen by the national government to roll out on a broader scale. Um, so the idea with 99 dots is that when a patient punches out their blister pack, they get a phone number for the day. Um, and then they call that phone number and leave a missed call to let the health worker know that they took their pill. And so that means that the health worker gets to see a dashboard like this, right, with all of their patients and which ones took their medications and, and which one didn't. And so this is already great, right? It means that health workers can see which patients are, are potentially struggling. Um, but right now in the status quo, they use this data in a primarily reactive way. They wait, they have to wait to see which patients have already missed several doses. And then those are the ones that they direct the most intensive follow-up at. Um, because a given health worker could be, could be responsible for tens or, or hundreds of, or up to 100 patients. And so when they think about costly interventions, like actually going and making a house visit, they can only focus those on the sort of uh, few most at-risk patients. And so the challenge that we'd like to think about from a computer science perspective then is how to shift into a more proactive stance. We want to be able to use the data that we have to predict future patient adherence and then optimize the interventions that health workers take to keep people um, uh, sort of on, on, on their course of medication. Now, the way that we usually design systems like this that combine prediction and optimization is what's what I'll call a, a two-stage approach. And so we start by using whatever historical data that we have to train a machine learning model. And that model is trained to maximize accuracy, measured by some sort of loss function that quantifies how close the model's predictions are to the ground truth. Then we take whatever the predictions are, and we feed them into an optimization algorithm that we've developed for this problem. Um, and that takes you know, whatever the estimate from the model is sort of as the ground truth and plans the optimal decision given that. And uh, so this is nice in that it lets us leverage our existing knowledge about algorithm design and about machine learning 
uh, it's easy to kind of put these two things together. Um, but the challenge is that sometimes th there can be a misalignment between accuracy and decision quality, um, because the loss function that the model sees might not be uh, what incentivizes the predictions that actually induce the best decisions from uh, from the optimizer. If you know accuracy is not, uh, it's, it's maybe it's not important to be globally accurate everywhere it matters to get certain features right that that let you identify the optimal decision. Now, one alternative approach that we often see kind of coming out of the ML literature these days is what I'll call a, a pure end-to-end -end approach. And so here, there is no optimization algorithm at all. There's just a big machine learning model that maps directly from, from whatever the input data is to whatever decision you want to have. And so, and then a lot of the time, this is some sort of big neural network and you train it end-to-end -to, -end to maximize decision quality. This is nice that you get to now optimize directly for whatever downstream metric you care about. Um, but it's really not easy to teach neural, neural networks how to solve optimization problems. There's a reason that this is sort of a, a you know active research area is that um, combinatorial optimization is difficult. It's really not trivial to teach neural networks how to respect these sort of intricate structures and come up with usable and optimal decisions. And this, this often requires an inordinate amount of effort. So what I want to propose is that these two um, approaches are kind of at opposite ends of a spectrum, but with reflecting how much existing algorithmic structure we build into the system. And there are pros and cons to being at either end of the spectrum here. Uh, where two-stage approaches let you kind of leverage existing algorithmic uh, knowledge, but then, uh, and end-to-end -end approaches are difficult, but offer the sort of potential to, to improve performance. And so, uh, so my work here tries to carve out an in-between that I'll call decision-focused learning. And here the, idea, the hope is that we can get some of the better performance offered by end-to-end -end approaches, but still build in the algorithmic knowledge that we have about, uh, you know, from, you know, decades of studying optimization problems. And, and hopefully this gives us some of the best of both worlds. Uh, so the, the idea here is that in my predictive system, I'm going to build in a differentiable component that solves the optimization problem in a way that allows you to back propagate through the solutions. So I can say how the solutions to the problem change as a function of the predictions that the ML model is, is making. And so if I can do that, then I can chain the entire thing together with gradient descent. Um, I can back propagate directly from whatever the decision quality that I get is through to the parameters of the machine learning model. Um, and so I get both end-to-end -end training and I can actually have the optimization done by an algorithm that, that's built for the problem that leverages expert knowledge. The problem when we try to set this up is that discrete optimization is not actually differentiable. Um, so, uh, so for example, take a, a linear program here, probably optimization of a linear function over a polytope. Um, and the, the issue here kind of visually is that if I have an objective function that's pointing in the direction of this vector theta, then the solution to the optimization problem can jump discontinuously as a function of whatever theta is. So if I perturb theta by sort of an arbitrarily small amount, the, the solution, the optimal solution can hop from one vertex to another um, because intuitively the optimal solution is whatever lies furthest in the direction of that factor within the, within the polytope. And, uh, and this is kind of a recurring issue more generally, right? The solution to discrete optimization problems will, will typically be discontinuous in whatever the, the parameters of the objective function are. And so my work proposes uh, a four-step recipe for differentiable relaxations to, to embed discrete optimization in machine learning training. And I'm going to walk through these steps one by one in the context of linear programming as an example. Um, so we'll take a linear program in, in standard form here, where we have an objective function that's a vector of theta. That's the linear function we want to maximize. And here, so then theta is our unknown parameter that we're going to predict. And then we have a set of linear constraints. And so step one here is to move from the discrete problem to a continuous relaxation. And so the idea is that we're going to use a continuous surrogate for the problem during training that still gives us information about the optimization problem, um, but still that can help us build in differentiability. And so in the context of linear programs, this means allowing the solutions to, uh, to vary you know, anywhere within the sort of the convex hull of those, of those extreme outer points. Um, but that's not enough by itself, because for linear programs, the optimal solutions are still always going to be at the vertices. Um, and so and that means that the derivatives that we want don't actually exist. And so the second step is to add a strongly convex term to the objective. Um, so this, uh, for, so for example, this could be the two norm of the decision variables. And this doesn't have any sort of semantic meaning, right? It's not like we want smaller decisions in any sense. It just builds in curvature into the objective. Um, formally, it ensures that the Hessian um, is, um, you know, is, is negative semi-definite in this case, uh, which, which means that, uh, that the derivatives are not going to be sort of um, you know, ill-defined. Then in the 
forward pass of each training iteration, we just solve this relaxation. And there's a lot of solvers that you can that you can use to do this efficiently um, for sort of generic problems. Or of course, if you have specialized knowledge about your particular domain, then you can leverage that to build a, a sort of custom solver. Um, and then in the backward pass, we take implicit derivatives through the solution to the optimization problem. So if X star is the is the optimal solution, then we want to compute the derivative of that with respect to theta um, to say what happens when we change the machine learning model. And we can do that by writing down the optimality conditions for, for convex optimization problems, which are the KKT conditions. And uh, that gives you a system of equations. You can differentiate that solution around the optimum um, to get another, another linear system where the unknown is dx d theta. And, and then solving that linear system gives you the derivatives that you need. And so we can show for linear programs, this gives us basically what we want, that um, the, the optimal solution becomes differentiable almost everywhere as a function of theta. And that moreover, we haven't messed things up too much by, by using this continuous serve yet, that the, the solution quality of the, of, this, of, of the vector that we get out of the continuous relaxation is, is close as a function of, of whatever strength we put on that regularization term, allowing us to kind of trade off between smoothness and, and fidelity to the original problem. Um, so I, I've, I've illustrated this pipeline in the, in the context of linear programs, um, but it really does extend more generally uh, with a set of collaborators I've, um, I've helped work out um, kind of how to extend this approach from where we envisioned it earlier in linear programming to more complex programs like ma uh, MaxSat or mixed integer linear programs um, or families of graph optimization problems, where there's challenges in making this efficient in, in every setting, right? Implementing the backward pass well and, uh, to, to exploit the structure of the problem. Um, but the general recipe seems to hold for a wide variety of discrete optimization problems. I'm going to then close out this section of the talk by going back to our original motivation and illustrating an, illustrating an application of these techniques to, to medication adherence. Um, so here in this part of the study, we use data that was shared with us by 99 dots on 17,000 patients in the city of Mumbai. And so this is uh, their, their, uh, their sequence of adherence over time. And then we're going to use this to train a machine learning model to predict patient adherence and then to optimize follow up by health workers. And so formally, we're going to try to maximize the number of missed doses that are caught so the number of times the patient would have missed the dose, but then a health worker intervenes beforehand. Uh, and we're going to do that subject to a budget constraint that, uh, that we have to match health workers to locations that we're going to visit. And of course, a health worker can, can only be in one place at a given time. And so here I'm going to compare our decision-focused approach with a two-stage approach. And these, these methods are, are quite close to each other. So both of them use an LSTM as the baseline kind of machine learning model. The difference is that the two-stage approach is trained to, for accuracy, right, to, to minimize cost entropy here for this uh, classification problem. But the decision-focused approach is trained with that linear program in the loop um, using the techniques that I just illustrated. And so here, I'll compare them all in two dimensions. The first on the left-hand side is the number of missed doses that are caught. So this is our measure of the solution quality of the intervention. And here we find that there's an edge for the decision-focused approach. We get about 15% more successful interventions, right? Interventions where a health worker gets to a patient before they miss a dose. And, uh, and this is in contrast to the right-hand side of the slide, where we look at AUC, right? A standard measure of classification accuracy. And we find that the two-stage approach is better here, right? It's doing what it was trained to do um, to just reflect uh, kind of accuracy in this global sense. And so what I think this illustrates is that Accuracy in a generic sense is not always what we need to enable impactful interventions. We need to more precisely define what we need the machine learning system to do, right? What role is going to play in the overall system that we're building. And then we want to be able to optimize and train specifically for that objective to get the best interventions in practice. So that concludes um, the, the focus, uh, this, this part of the talk. Um, if there's questions here about this material, we can, uh, we can take them or also move on to the, to the next part about community level interventions. I think we can have questions at the end. Cool. Yeah. Great. Um, then, uh, so moving on to the next part of the talk, um, the application focus of this work is HIV prevention for homeless youth. Um, so this is another huge public health challenge um, in Los Angeles where we did this work. There's about 6,000 youth who are homeless at any given time. And these youth have about 10 times the rate of HIV prevalence compared to the general population. Um, and this is due to a variety of disparities and vulnerabilities that this kind of unique population has. Accordingly, uh, centers that work with homeless youth and offer services will hold educational interventions where they try to raise awareness about HIV and about prevention strategies. But due to resource constraints, they can't actually hold those interventions directly with all of the hundreds of youth that might frequent a given drop-in center. They have limited capacity. And so instead, they train a small number of youth as peer leaders 
Uh, and the idea is that they're going to get these youth to spread the, the message about HIV prevention through their social network. This is where we come in as computer scientists because we can formalize this as an optimization problem, right? When we think about choosing the most effective set of peer leaders, then we can think about the graph that represents the social connections between the youth. And then we can have a constrained discrete optimization problem where we have a budget of K peer leaders that we're going to select um, from the nodes of this graph. And we'd like to identify the most influential set of peer leaders, right? The peer leaders who are going to reach the most other youth with information. So here I'll have again an objective function that, is, that describes the expected number of nodes that are reached. I'll have my decision variable now to set S, the subset of nodes that I choose to be peer leaders. And then I'm still going to have this, this theta, right? The unknown model parameters. Um, and typically here theta describes something about the structure of the graph and how information is going to propagate across it. Uh, the most common example and the one that we'll use in this work is what's called the independent cascade model, where every edge of the graph has a propagation probability on it. And this describes the probability that if one node receives information that they'll pass it on to the node on the other side of the edge. And so now theta is just the collection of all of those probabilities, right, that describe how information is going to diffuse and determine what the most influential set of nodes will be. Now there's, um, there's plenty of work um, uh, sort of related to, to these kinds of optimization problems. I'm going to spend two slides giving a little bit of background on one of the key concepts here, which is submodularity. So, uh, for, so intuitively, submodularity just means diminishing returns. That as I select more peer leaders, the, the marginal benefit of each peer leader in terms of influence only goes down um, and because many people in, in the network will already have been reached. And, uh, and then there's this kind of classic result uh, from the 70s that when your objective function is a monotone submodular function, you can do you can really take the simplest algorithm, right? That's the greedy algorithm just that just iteratively selects whoever has the greatest marginal gain. And that gives you the optimal possible approximation ratio for this problem, one minus one over e. There's also uh, kind of more recently over the last 10 years or so, an alternate approach that's been developed for these problems where we take the discrete problem and relax it into a continuous space. So instead of picking a discrete set of seed nodes, now I have a vector x where xi is the probability that I choose node. And I get to pick any you know, probability vector that sums up to k, my, my total budget constraint. And now my objective value is the expected uh, value of a set drawn with those probabilities, where I sample all of the nodes independently, including node i with probability xi. And then you can show that, um, that by appropriately optimizing this continuous objective function and rounding afterwards, you get the same approximation ratio of 1 minus 1 over e. So there's, there's plenty of work that applies these kinds of techniques to, to influence maximization. Um, so there's this kind of long line of work over the last, um, coming up on 20 years or so in the theoretical computer science and AI literature. Um, but almost entirely, this work assumes that we know the underlying model of information diffusion exactly. That someone tells you exactly what the structure of the graph is and what the probabilities on all of the edges are. And of course, when we go to do influence maximization in the field in a public health setting, we don't know any of these things, right? We don't know how influence propagates. There's very little data available about homeless youth populations. And we don't even know the structure of the social network to start with. Just gathering that data about who's connected to who requires in-person surveys and a week or more of effort on the part of uh, kind of a dedicated social work research team. And so the goal of this project was to build algorithms that address these kinds of these two uh, data-based bottlenecks to deploying effective interventions in this area. And so over the course of the last few years, uh, we developed these algorithms um, to, to put together an AI augmented intervention that we call CHANGE. And CHANGE was evaluated in a field trial over the last couple of years that enrolled over 700 youth in total at a set of, of three participating drop-in centers in Los Angeles. And this trial found that uh, the intervention planned with CHANGE uh, delivered a statistically significant reduction in risk behaviors by homeless youth where standard methods didn't really have an impact. And so I'm gonna spend the rest of the, uh, of the section of the talk um, building up the set of algorithms that we used and then, and then showcasing the results from this trial in a little more detail. So starting out with the first part of our, of our, of our change system here, uh, dealing with uncertainty about how information propagates. We're going to address this challenge with, uh, with techniques from robust optimization. So the idea behind robust optimization is that if I don't know the ground truth exactly, then I'll try to find a decision that works well regardless of what that ground truth is. So I don't have to, in some sense, care about it anymore. Uh, so more formally, given a set of candidate ob objective functions, perhaps representing different ways that I could write down the propagation probabilities on all of the edges, then I'll try to solve a maximum optimization problem where I'm taking the worst case over all of these possible scenarios. Uh, because if I can find a decision that works well in the worst case, then it'll, it'll work well for, for, uh, for all of these scenarios, regardless of what the ground truth happens to be. 
The challenge, though, it turns out to be computational, that uh, solving the max spin optimization problem is much harder than optimizing a single to modular function. It turns out to be NP hard even to approximate the problem at all, uh, forcing us to see kind of tractable relaxations. Um, and that's even uh, for the most kinds of generic instances of these problems. For influence maximization, there's an additional challenge, which is that M, the number of objective functions that I'm taking them in over, um, is often exponentially large or even infinite, uh, which, which introduces this sort of whole other layer of complication. I'm going to show a motivating example of a robust optimization setting for influence maximization where you can get these really large uncertainty sets. And this is the distributionally robust setting. So the idea here is that I can view um, any given theta, right, any collection of model parameters as a distribution over how influence will propagate on the graph, right, which edges will propagate influence and which won't. And so maybe I have some guess that I'll call theta hat, which is on, on the left-hand side, side of the slide here. This is the dot in the center of the, of the polygon. But I don't know exactly what the ground truth is. And so I'm going to try to find a decision that works well for any distribution that resembles theta. And so formally, I'll write down a measure of distance on distribution, like the chi-square divergence. And then I'm going to make my uncertainty set here, right? the set of objectives that I'll consider to be those induced by any distribution, which is within some distance row of theta. And this is nice because it handles uncertainty about even the underlying model of information diffusion. Right? I can have correlations, for example, between the probabilities that edges will propagate influence, which isn't allowed in the standard independent scale model, so it's pretty non-parametric in some sense. Um, it also has nice connections to, to statistical working theory, gives you generalization guarantees. But the, the problem is that that ball is a continuous set, right? There's an infinite number of distributions that are within you know, any, any fixed distance of my point estimate. And so this really presents a problem for existing computational approaches to robust modular optimization. For, uh, existing approaches are largely tailored to the setting where the number of possible ob objectives is relatively small. Um, so formally, it's polynomial and probably a pretty small get most linear in the number and in the size of the problem, right? the size of the graph, for example. Um, and that's because these approaches rely on being able to exhaustively enumerate all of the possible scenarios in a greedy style algorithm. And that is obviously infeasible once your uncertainty sets become exponentially larger or infinite in size. And so our work introduces then a new take on robust modular optimization, where we no longer have any direct dependency on the size of the uncertainty set. Instead, uh, because instead of using greedy style approaches, we switch to techniques based on a continuous relaxation, show that we can extend these techniques to the robust setting. And then uh, this enables efficient optimization whenever we can find the worst case scenario for a fixed set. Um, so we instead, we, we just need to build this kind of oracle that gives us the, the worst case scenario, which we can do efficiently for a number of settings of interest, like the distributionally robust setting that, that I showed you earlier, in, in addition to several others in this, in this kind of space. And so um, kind of, more, more formally comparing to, to related work here. Um, I'm you know, showing here the, the dependence on, on the size of, on, of the runtime with, with M versus the approximation quality that we get. But there's a couple of ways that you can measure approximation quality depending on how you relax the problem. And basically, um, our, our work gives you the optimal approximation ratio or else quite close to it um, while, uh, while allowing you to avoid this, this runtime scaling with M um, that's present in all of the kind of recent related work in this space. And so the, the key um, sort of approach that we're going to take here is to relax the problem to a zero sum game. Instead of, uh, for, instead of saying that we're going to pick a single set of seek nodes, instead we'll pick a distribution over seek nodes. And, um, and then we'll take the worst case against that distribution. So this is the equivalent to playing a zero sum game where, where now our, our adversary in the game is picking the, um, the choice of parameters. And this is nice because it means that we're optimizing over a continuous space, and we can bring in this kind of more powerful set of tools from, um, from continuous optimization. So, uh, so if we so now if we write down the continuous relaxations of each of the objectives in our uncertainty set, um, which is using the exact same strategy that I showed you earlier, where we're considering um, the expected value of, of a probabilistic strategy, including each node then we're going to try to maximize the point-wise minimum of all of those continuous relaxations with respect to the parameters describing influence squared. And so our kind of our key technical contribution here is showing that extending these continuous approaches to the maximum problem allows you to get the speed up for large uncertainty sets. The algorithm that we propose then is called the quater. And the, so the idea is that we're going to apply gradient-based optimization methods, so first order optimization to this point-wise minimum that I'll call G. And the, the nice thing about, about this is that we can get um, a gradient or maybe a super gradient of G 
just by finding the minimizing theta. There's no need to, to sort through all of the different objectives, objectives explicitly. There are some additional technical issues that we have to resolve here, um, essentially by adding controlled randomness at different points in the algorithm to ensure smoothness and, and helplessness by randomization, uh, the, uh, the, the randomized rounding algorithm. Um, but this is the kind of high level idea. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna illustrate this here um, in, a, in a simple sort of setting. Um, so suppose that we're picking between two different seed notes and we have a budget of one. So here's the, the feasible uh, points that we, can, that we can be at, right? I can choose neither node or I can choose one or I can choose the other. Now we're going to start by relaxing that to continuous space so you can choose any set of probabilities of the two nodes that sum up to one. And our algorithm is going to maintain a feasible point somewhere in the interior of, of this feasible set. At each iteration, it's going to, uh, you know, there's going to be the, the gradients of all the different objective functions, possibly very many of them pointing in, in different directions. And our algorithm is going to use this oracle for the adversary to figure out what the worst case scenario for us right now. So suppose that the, the worst case objective function for us is F3. And then we'll look just at the gradient of F3, and we'll identify the vertex of the feasible set that lies furthest in the direction of that, of that gradient, and we'll take a step in that direction. And uh, we show that if you instantiate the strategy appropriately, it gives you the, uh, the optimal 1 minus 1 over A approximation to the robust problem. Um, and so this, uh, and this really helps us resolve some of the computational barriers to efficient robust optimization in this space. However, um, Uncertainty about the, the parameters of the influence model was not our only problem, right? The, there's this other issue that we don't even know the structure of the social network to start with. And this is what the, the second piece of our system um, aims to deal with. And so here, uh, the problem is that existing work largely assumes that someone tells you the social network as the input to the problem. But in reality, none of that information is available. Um, everything has to be gathered from scratch. And it's a really expensive and time consuming process. Um, digital data sources do not work well for these populations. They're often inaccurate or missing entirely. And so that means that you have to go in person and interview all of the hundred or more youth at a given center to figure out who they're connected to. And the motivation for this piece of work is whether we can just subsample the network instead. Um, so instead of surveying everyone exhaustively, can we just survey a limited number of youth and use the connections that they report to still be able to identify who the influential nodes are? Unfortunately, we can show in general that this is actually impossible. So there exist graphs where any algorithm that, that has a constant approximation ratio to the, the optimal set of nodes um, has to query nearly the entire network. So this is stated informally. It means that there's kind of no free lunch here. You, you have to query nearly everyone to get the optimal result in the worst case. The solution, though, is that we can try to exploit more realistic forms of network structure that we often see in real world populations. And so here, uh, we developed a theoretical result, which is an algorithm based on simulating random walks that we can show uh, obtains an approximation guarantee for a community structure graph. Um, but what I'm going to cover here is a simplified version that we used in practice. This excludes what's due to what's called the friendship paradox. And the friendship paradox is just the idea that, on average, your friends are more popular than you are. Um, so this is the degree distribution um, from one of the, the networks that we, that we gathered out with, with the homeless youth populations in LA. And, uh, and on the left-hand side is the degree distribution of a random node. And so this is skewed to the left, meaning that most nodes have relatively small degree, right? Most people have few connections. But the right-hand side um, is, the, is the degree distribution of a random neighbor of a random node, which is skewed a lot more to the right. And this is because when you sample neighbors, you sample people who are connected to others. So you disproportionately hit high degree nodes with lots of connections. And so this suggests a pretty simple mechanism for gathering network data. You just repeatedly survey a random node and then survey one of its neighbors at random. And this balances between hitting uh, very diverse parts of the graph with, uh, with random sampling um, and then biasing the search in the second step towards high degree nodes that can give you a lot of information about the graph. And this is what's going to provide the input into our robust optimization algorithm. Our, our final system change um, uses the, the sampling method that I just illustrated to gather network data that, that's input into the robust optimization algorithm to choose the set of three leaders that we're going to, that we're going to train. Looking then at the, at the field deployment. Um, so this is um, work that we did in collaboration with social work partners at the University of Southern California um, and with these three drop-in centers, Safe Place for Youth, My Friend's Place, and the Los Angeles LGBT Center. And, uh, and we did this, this study over the course of the last couple of years. The idea here is that we have a three-arm field trial. So we're going to compare um, several, we're going to compare three populations of youth. The first is where um, there's an intervention that's planned using change, our method. 
The second is where there's an intervention, the same intervention, but what just plans using degree centrality. This means just selecting the highest degree nodes from the social network to be the peer leaders. Um, and this is kind of the standard practice in public health. It, it corresponds just to selecting the most popular people on the theory that those would be the most influential. And then finally, we're gonna have a control group that receives no intervention at all, but who we still survey at the same interval um, to, to let us draw statistically meaningful comparisons about the rates of behavior change that are attributable to the intervention. And so the way the trial design works is that with each of the three drop-in centers, we're going to run each of the three arms once. So we'll, we'll run change at each of the drop-in centers, we'll run degree centrality at each of the drop-in centers, and we'll run a control group at each of the drop-in centers. And this is going to be staggered apart so that the population of youth at a given center basically turns over completely by the time we revisit it for another round of the trial. In each of these individual deployments, there's going to be three steps. We're going to start with a baseline uh, where we recruit youth to participate in the trial, about 80 youth at each of these uh, individual centers. We'll survey them for their baseline rates of risk behaviors related to HIV. And then we'll do the intervention. We'll train about 10 to 12 of them over the course of a month as peer leaders, but using whichever of the, of the algorithms is, is kind of planning the intervention for that arm. Or of course, if it's the control group, we'll skip the step entirely and, and not train anyone. But then for all of the groups, we're gonna do a follow-up step where we bring those original 80 youth back at one and three months after the interventions to see if they actually change their behaviors in response to the messages that the peer leaders were, were putting out. And we're going to then measure behavior change according to three sort of key outcomes that reflect risk behaviors and general knowledge about HIV. We'll measure cognitive anal sex, vaginal sex, and then also an HIV knowledge questionnaire. And our analysis framework then is when we look at the results, is we, we wanna know whether we get a statistically significant improvement in each of these outcome measures versus the observation only control group. And we'll, we'll look at this after controlling for a range of demographic uh, factors, a range of baseline risk behaviors uh, to try to isolate the causal effect of the, of the algorithm in this process. And, uh, and as is kind of common for clinical trials, we'll present the results in the form of an odds ratio for the binary outcomes, which is the, the reduction or increase in the odds of a behavior after um, after participating in the intervention. So an odds ratio of less than one indicates improvement. So here's the first, uh, so here's the results. Um, so let's look first at HIV knowledge. We find here that there's uh, an improvement in both groups with respect to HIV knowledge, that there is this slight kind of about 4% uh, or so uh, estimated increase over time um, in, in the percentage of, of correct um, responses. So that's great, both, both interventions are doing something but we don't just want to look at knowledge, we want to know whether youth are actually doing something differently as a result of the intervention. And here we find um, that there's more of a difference between the groups. So looking first at condomless vaginal sex, we find that there's a statistically significant um, at P less than 0.1 reduction um, in, in, uh, in this outcome for the group where the intervention was planned with change, but no significant change for degree centrality. And we find um, actually a stronger and even more significant result for condomless anal sex, which is the most important risk behavior. Um, out, of, out of the three outcomes that we're tracking here. And so this uh, really gives us um, a, an important signal that AI uh, can, play an important, uh, can play a role in how we design these interventions, because it really matters um, how we use limited data. It matters how we plan and optimize limited resources under uncertainty, because that can make the, the difference in these highly constrained data limited settings between an intervention that can successfully achieve its, its objectives, that can make a difference in this high risk population versus one that's not targeted effectively enough and ends up uh, not achieving its, its primary goals. With that, I'm going to switch to the, the last part of this talk. And this is going to be um, a bit of a, a shorter look at some of our recent work related to COVID-19 and thinking about how we can use a combination of techniques from inference and modeling um, to inform um, society level policy questions. The premise for this work is that the COVID-19 pandemic, pandemic is characterized by a lot of unknowns, right? Fundamentally, we have pretty limited aggregate data um, that doesn't reflect the kinds of granular questions we want to get at. We want to know, you know how fast the disease is spreading, how many people have been affected, what are the differences between different populations, when are new outbreaks starting. And so there's a role for AI here to help us disentangle these, these, these different noisy sources of data and then inform the decisions that we need to make. And our, our general approach here is to couple together modeling and inference. Um, so we build agent-based models in collaboration with epidemiologists that help us build in sort of domain knowledge about how uh, SARS-CoV-2 works as a virus, how different populations tend to interact. Um, but then we use 
Bayesian inference techniques to try to get at unknowns in, um, in the model and, and use this, um, then this, this kind of general family of tools as a lens to ask questions about between population differences to help develop more effective testing strategies and to help detect outbreaks from sparse data. Um, so our first paper in this space looked at between population differences. So we, we instantiated an ancient-based model for three hard hit locations, Hubei, China, Lombardy, Italy, and New York City in the US. And then we used important sampling to, uh, uh, to infer unknown parameters describing how the disease was, was operating at a population level in each of these places. And we found that there were key difference, differences between these populations in the level of transmissibility of the disease in the uh, key prevalence after the first wave, and then how these factors would combine with, uh, with social institutions and patterns of contact to shape second wave outbreaks. And so this initial work appeared in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences um, and helped us um, you know, show sort of how we can use this combination of modeling as an infer and, and, and inference as a tool to understand policy questions. But then our, our more recent work um, extends the model to investigate testing strategies. So this is a really crucial question when we think about controlling epidemics effectively, because we need to be able to, uh, to identify infected people and get them to isolate themselves really, uh, really as quickly as possible. And so this, uh, this portion of our work asked whether it's better to have really sensitive tests or whether it's better to have frequent cheap tests that we can administer regularly, even if they're not as accurate on an individual basis. And so we extended the model to include within host viral kinetics um, of you know, how, how different tests would, would operate over the course of an individual's infection, and then the consequences of that at a population level. And we found that unequivocally, frequency and turnaround time are much, much more important than sensitivity. So the, the graph here is showing that um, the gap between the high and the low sensitivity, low sensitivity tests, right, the blue and the yellow bars, is much smaller than the gap between testing people every three days and testing people every five days for infection control. And, uh, and so these results are, are set to appear soon in science advances. Um, and they've had um, at least some impact on the policy discussion around testing policy. So there's been a lot of coverage in the media and it's, uh, it's allowed our epidemiological collaborators to, to advocate to the, to the regulatory agencies, to the CDC about using rapid frequent testing, uh, even if it's not as sensitive. And recently, this has now made an appearance in the Biden team's transition plan that they're going to push for large scale investment in at home testing to control outbreaks. And so, of course, this is work that, you know, primarily, like I'm not the one, or, you know, us as computer scientists are not the ones driving the side of the work. This is our epidemiological collaborators who are out here fighting for all of this. Um, but I think it's a good example of how this kind of interdisciplinary work can, can benefit both sides because we can help provide the, the tools, right, the methodological uh, support that allows the, the real domain experts here to, to make the case. And, uh, and then finally, um, in our, our sort of most recent, most recent work in this, uh, in this vein is asking how we can do outbreak detection from, from screening testing. Uh, because um, we all know, I think that early detection when a new outbreak starts is really critical because acting earlier is always better than acting later when, when cases are rising exponentially. And so we'd like to be able to detect outbreaks in the really early stages from noisy screening tests that are being administered to a potentially small fraction of the population. And this, it turns out, presents a really interesting set of computational and statistical challenges because it's not clear in the early days of an outbreak necessarily when you're screening, a, when you're testing a very small number of people, whether whether there's something to be worried about or not, right? Whether uh, whether an outbreak is, is starting to blow up. And so, this uh, so we 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 set this up as a Bayesian inference problem where the key technical challenge is tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of discrete latent variables connecting the observations that we get in the form of test results from underlying parameters that we'd like to infer about the rate of, of spread of the disease in, in the population. And so we develop stochastic variational inference methods that can help us connect these two uh, and, and use the observations to get access to an accurate and well-calibrated posterior distribution over the true rate of spread. And, um, and so with that, I'm, I'm going to start wrapping up the talk. And I'd like to, to come back um, to, to where I started. Um, so I told you that um, you know, AI today in, in a health context is largely dominated by clinical applications. And over the course of this talk, I've, you know, tried to, to point out like a few examples of places where AI can be impactful, impactful from a population health perspective and where working on these problems really raises fundamental new problems in, in computation, right? And optimization and machine learning and reasoning about social behaviors. Um, and so now uh, what I really believe is that this is just the start. 
right? This is a, a very small fraction of what's out there. There's countless other problems that we should be thinking about um, in, for health at a societal and population level. And this is something that we should be excited about as computer scientists, because there's countless new computational problems that allow us to, to link up really fundamental challenges in artificial intelligence with the kinds of questions that are going to help make us healthier as a society as a whole. And so, uh, and so thank you all for being here, and I'm happy to take questions now. Great. Thank you, Brian. Thank you so much. Uh, are there any questions? Anybody? Well, I have two questions. Uh, uh, and, and meanwhile, if, if somebody else has, has any questions, they can ask. Uh, my first question is about your, your HIV work. Uh, and uh, in that work, you, I mean, you know, it's great that uh, you got statistical significance results. My question though is that you, I mean, from a, comp, from a computer science perspective, the thing that you developed were influence maximization techniques, right? Uh, and so is it fair to say that in the, in the real world deployments that you did uh, in, in that particular domain, uh, the results that you have still don't allow you to get statistical, you know, statist statistically significant superiority of your influence maximization technique as opposed to degree centrality. Uh, yeah, so, so yes, yeah, so you're asking about like the sort of head-to-head -head comparison. Right. Um, yeah, so, um, there is statistical significance in a head-to-head -head comparison for a subset of the results at some points in time. Um, but it's basically the problem here is that, you know, your, your study, given the sample size, is powered to detect some effect size, right? Like, you, you know, you need to see at least some difference between you and the control group in, in, in order to pick up that difference in a statistically significant way, given the number of participants you have. And that's always, it's easier to do that versus a control group, right? Because the difference between you and the control group is going to be bigger than you and the difference between another interview. Um, so we probably would have needed a, a, you know, a significantly larger trial, which is, you know, this already took, you know, several years and a million dollars or so. So it's, it's not really logistically feasible for us to double the sample size to resolve all of these questions more finely. Uh, but I think we can be quite confident that it works better than the degree centrality approach because we do have, so, you know, we do have some uh, statistically significant head-to-head -head comparisons. And then we can also see, you know, that overall a, the AI arm is, is outperforming the control group, whereas the degree centrality arm is not. Good. Good. Uh... And the second question uh, that I had with just was with respect to COVID. So, so, I mean, you were showing results on testing, right? So that more frequent with lesser turnaround is better than uh, testing, which is more sensitive, but it takes more time. No, no. So now, now is that a, a black versus white comparison that you've done that, that, that either you apply this frequent testing to everybody, uh, the, the entire population, or you apply this highly sensitive testing to everybody is that because because in reality i would assume that you would have a mix of both worlds i mean i mean no, nobody's going to employ only tests which are highly sensitive nobody's going to employ only tests which are so, so there's going to be some sort of a uh, a portfolio of uh, i mean from from a from a policy planning perspective also when people are planning out budgets they would need to figure out how to allocate their amount of money into how, what percentage of the money should be allocated for sensitive tests, what's, what percentage of the money should be allocated. So, so is that some part uh, considered in, in, in the work that you've done or, or, or is that a one versus all, uh, one versus zero sort of a comparison? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, so I think the way that we, we tend to think about this is that these tests really have different roles. And right now we're kind of forcing highly sensitive tests into a role that they're not suited for. Um, because there's there's at least two different purposes that we can have. One is clinical diagnosis, right? We need to, a patient comes in with symptoms and you need to tell, do they have COVID to be able to treat them properly? The other is controlling outbreaks, right? So this is like how colleges now like want to test, you know, everyone twice a week just to be able to try to screen out infectious people and, and shut down clusters before they start. And so absolutely, like a physician probably wants the most sensitive test possible. And they probably want, you know, multiple tests at different points in time to be able to precisely track the trajectory of someone's outbreak. And we should be allocating resources for that so that patients get the best care possible. Um, but our, our focus here in this paper was at the population level, when we try to, when we're testing everyone repeatedly, right, even asymptomatic people, um, just to try to shut down outbreaks, then which strategy tends to work better. And, um, and here, the, the gain from sensitive tests is, I think, um, very low compared to just doing more tests. And given the cost differential, where, you know, highly sensitive PCR tests cost $100, $200, and antigen oh, wow. tests cost maybe $5. Yeah, so my, it's pretty unequivocal. Right. So my understanding is that having 
uh, the, the or the way I like to think, I mean, it might be false, so please correct me if I'm wrong, but the way I view them is uh, these, these uh, less sensitive tests are, 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 are mechanisms through which you can gain information about or partial observation about where you are on the epidemic curve because you can do them at, at, at scale. Uh, so, so they can be sort of like a querying function uh, uh, as opposed to so, uh, the highly sensitive tests, they are going to give you more accurate information, but obviously you know, the, the turnaround time is a huge issue. But since you can do these tests, tests so, many, so frequently and, and, and you can get the results instantly, uh, you know, each person can take a test maybe five times a day, which can be used as a signal to you know, which can be used to construct a, a, a fairly accurate signal as to, to to figure out where the entire population is on, on the epidemic curve, right? And uh, so, is that fair? Any any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think that's that's one significant benefit, right? Better tracking of the outbreak. But I think the, the other benefit is just um, it's just squashing the outbreak to begin with, right? Because if you're testing yourself every day, even if the test is is wrong, some you know some percentage of the time. Um, if everyone does that, you'll, it'll, you just, you know, won't be able, you, you know, the, the reproduction rate will be too low for outbreaks to start in the first place. Right. But then, so, so there's also this issue that what, what uh, or, or the perception of a, of a, of a, of a negative uh, mm -hmm. with, with less sensitive tests, what, what, how, how do people perceive that to, uh, I mean, I mean, so, I mean, scientifically it's known that, you know, a, a test might, might have a 50% sensitivity rate, which is, Okay, uh, but but when, when a person sees that that he he his test has come out negative, uh, you know, may, does does it lead to situations where he suddenly feels that you know I'm, I I don't have COVID I I can go and roam around on the streets, uh, so that yeah. that is yeah. that is also a consideration that needs to be thought about uh, when, when deciding the trade-off between uh, both these kinds of tests. Yeah, no, I mean this is an important like sort of science communication issue, right? That a negative test result. Um, just means that you don't need to isolate yourself, basically, right? It's not like a, a sort of free pass to go do anything that you want. Um, but I, I mean, I think historically, like when we think about public health, um, this is more often the productive way to think about things, right? We, for example, like there's the same concerns with like HIV tests, right? That if you, you know, if you make it easy for people to learn their HIV status, then maybe this will make them careless. Um, but really, the the right answer is just to layer all of these, all like all of the interventions that we can on top of each other, right? To have really frequent, easy access to testing, and then still promote you know, preventative behaviors and conflict usage and everything else, right? And it's, it's by putting all of these pieces together that we really get effective outbreak control. Right. Cool, cool, cool. Thank you. Uh, other, okay, so there's a question by Kenneth. Can you share some of your experiences in deploying such models to the wild? Did you encounter anything unexpected when working with people in the wild? What's their opinion about using AI? Yeah, yeah, this is a great question. Um, I mean, this was always an, a, a very interesting process. Um, and, and there are certainly issues that you that you don't expect. Um, so like, so for example, when we were working on the, the HIV prevention project, um, one issue here is that when you invite homeless youth to, to show up for this intervention to be trained as peer leaders, about half the time they just don't show up, right? Because they, you know, they got arrested, they can't afford money for a bus ticket, right? There's a lot of barriers that can sort of get in the way. Um, and this is something that we hadn't thought about ahead of time until we actually tried doing a pilot study. And then I didn't talk about it in, in here, but there, you know, there's a set of kind of domain specific adaptations that we needed to make, right? You know, for example, planning in this kind of contingency that some people um, are going to are going to show up and your your choices you know, needs to reflect that. Um, and this, this is just one example, right? There's all sorts of, of things that come up in the process of trying to pilot these things. And so I think, um, oh, and, and then the question, what's what's the the opinion from others about using AI? Um, I think um, I think there's a lot of excitement about the possibilities of AI, but there's also some amount of skepticism on the part of domain experts, right? That this is like really, like you're actually going to show up and make a difference in, you know, for, for their particular population. Um, and so I don't think that there's any way around just spending a lot of time building those relationships, right? Like actually spending weeks, you know, at drop-in centers or, you know, you know, visiting, visiting doctors and patients and, and you know, and, and learning about the area, right? In, in, in a new Thank you. Uh, if there uh, if there are no more questions, I guess we can end. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Brian, for coming in and sharing your your, your research with us. Uh,